let's might as well start right on time. So good morning, everyone. I see some seats here and there for the people in the back if you want to sit in the front row. My name is Yuri Budnik. I work for RightScale. Part of the presentation, Jacob is going to come into the stage and help me as well. He's an architect uh, with our friends from Brackspace. I've been with RightScale for four and a half years, so I've had the opportunity to see the public cloud starting early on and then a lot of the private cloud, uh, exciting open stack things that we've been seeing lately. And I'm gonna talk to you about this idea of the difference between virtualization and a cloud and why does it uh, really matter. And I'm gonna show you some slides, but I'm mostly gonna go into a demo. If you wanna ask me questions during the demo, that tends to be more fun than saving them to the end. It's a bigger crowd, so it might be a little bit uh, trickier to be able to keep track of that. I want, maybe this is not working. So for my benefit, if, uh, for my benefit, if you guys don't mind, of the people that are here in the room, how many are IT managed or work in IT in some capacity and are looking at maybe deploying OpenStack and wanna understand what that means and see if they wanna undertake that? So a few. Uh, how many of the people in the room are running some sort of virtualization in their data center today, VMware or anything else like that? So a lot of those, okay. Uh, let me see, I had another question that I wanted to ask. Um, how many are running a private cloud already, whether it's uh, in not production, but maybe they're testing something or they're looking at using it for the developers? So a small number, okay, so it sort of fits with what I was guessing was gonna be in the room. So the differences seem a little bit nuanced and they're actually hard to define if you really get very deeply into semantics. But what I hope to show you in the demonstration especially is that the differences come into play in practice, what you can do and the results that you can drive. More than really worrying about defining things in a very specific and exacting way. But let's make no mistake, cloud computing is possible because of virtualization. In many ways, it's a logical extension of what started happening with virtualization. It's sort of the next step. With virtualization, we saw that the development and the advancements in hardware were pacing software being able to take advantage of it. Really powerful CPUs, lots of memory, the applications were not keeping up, so lots and lots of idle servers. <coughs> and companies, as they started putting in virtualization, and I learned yesterday that there's barely a dent in the large enterprises that have actually migrated to that, by the way. I thought everybody was doing that already. It turns out not. But it was about server <laughs> consolidation for economic savings. And once you do that, you start discovering some benefits <coughs> that you can do by automating some things. That's what I'm talking about, a matter of degree, because that's really where the, where the cloud comes into play. But it's the differences in how you automate those things that can make a, a difference. So I think when we went from data centers to virtualization was more of an evolutionary change, doing the same things just a little faster because you got that hypervisor layer that gives you that abstraction so you can move it around. But what I hope to show you here is the jump to cloud computing without automation, it's actually a fundamental change in how you do things. So maybe here's a good example to outline the difference of wh when you got virtualization and when you have cloud. Let's do a hypothetical one here. Let's say you take a bunch of virtualized servers you have and you move them to a public cloud. Well, what have you accomplished? Well, you're not paying by the hour for those machines, you're running in a shared environment, uh, probably less powerful hardware and maybe a little bit more likely to fail. So not a lot of advantages there. So obviously there's a difference between I got this virtualized and I got that cloud because if you just move it, there's no actual advantage there. So here's, what, what I really mean when we're talking about cloud computing. It's really about creating this self-service automation that makes it possible for the people that are the clients of IT to dramatically collapse the amount of time it takes for them to, develop, to deploy the environments they need. And as I said a moment ago, it seems sort of nuanced because there's a lot of these things that you can do with virtualization as well. So I'll show in the demonstration what I really mean, but it's not, I took it from six weeks to one week, is I can provision things now, within the hour, in the next 20 minutes. That's what I mean when I say lightning fast. And by the way, for those of us that have been at this for a while, there's an interesting side effect that maybe you guys haven't encountered. When you put that much power in the hands of the different people and in your different business units, you realize, boy, I really keep, I, I need to keep track now of who's launching what and how much resources they're consuming. 
Turns out cost tracking is really important because that can get way out of hand with the public or private clouds once you put that power into those people. So in my view, it, it, it fundamentally changes the role of IT. It's not a request organization where they're fulfilling tickets. It's about being a service-oriented organization that creates pre-configured assets that the different clients of IT can deploy at will. So it means IT can still maintain control, have, have the environments they have comply with the policies they need for security and other business reasons, but they're no longer a gatekeeper, an organization that mostly says no, and you gotta wait, talk to me again in six weeks or in two months, is you can deploy it now as you want to. So hopefully if you do this right, you have an IT infrastructure, an internal cloud that feels like this and like this, but not like this. And <laughs> by the way, those guys are not doing acrobatic. They have a flat tire and they need to get to a gas station somewhere. And the guy's holding on the front wheel with a wrench. So uh, anybody that's worked in a data center and I used to, sometimes you're gonna do things with duct tape and chicken wire and bubble gum. And they're not, they're not fun. So hopefully it feels a little bit like this. You got developers that need servers during the day. They don't need to be running them at night. So it'd be useful if they just sort of release them or they terminate and back up automatically when they don't want them but then you need to run your quarterly end, why don't you reuse those same machines? But then it turns out that there's a new security patch you need to deploy. You wanna throw up some environments to smoke test that thing before you do it. And then it turns out that that's not working, so now you gotta fork that thing and try a different way. So you're developing and deploying and launching all these different environments at different speeds. And now you wanna back out of it, and I think the, the next thing you're gonna do is they're gonna run through each other. If you can create an infrastructure that behaves this well, you know the job's going. By the way, that's a Japanese synchronized walking thing. <laughs> so I'd like to pass the presentation over to Jacob that's gonna talk a little bit about the specifics of OpenStack and then I'll come back. When you start to deploy your applications into an OpenStack cloud, you have to come in and you have to consume all the different bits that you need to make your application work. So your application now has to know about where to go and get its compute resources, where to go and get its networking, what those pieces are capable of. And for a lot of folks, that requires thinking differently about how they are deploying their applications today versus how they were doing it yesterday. There's a big difference in the way that you think about deploying an application, making it highly available, making it scalable when you make that transition from the virtualization world to the cloud world. For many people, the virtualization world has always meant VMware. Um, and whether it's meant you know, VMware or Zen or whatever else for you, you've probably leveraged something that looks like this, where when you made the switch from having servers and racks running an operating system on bare metal to consolidating those servers into virtual machines, taking all of those servers and making them containers, everything still kind of looked the same. You know, Yuri mentioned the fact that it was, a, it was an evolutionary step. There was not a whole lot that happened during that change. Maybe you saved some money on power, maybe you didn't have to buy as many boxes, whatever the case may have been. Now we're looking at this world where your application not only knows about the infrastructure that it's running on, but it's running on infrastructure that may be spread out across more than just your East Coast, West Coast data center, but spread out across clouds around the world. Thank you. So, we will keep coming back to the theme of application-driven, application-focused versus infrastructure-focused. That's what I meant specifically when I was talking about a fundamental change, and I'm about to jump into the demo on a couple more slides, and, and you'll see that. Let me give you an analogy that, that maybe will help see some of that through. Let's think about TCP IP. Really simple because it does just one job, send IP packets where they need to go, the addressing system and the transmission control protocol. It doesn't have all these complex features on it. It just makes sure the packets get to where they need to go. Maybe it changes the speed or retransmits or changes the window sizes for those of you that are more on the networking side. And then other people on top of it build things like ICMP and quality of service and HTTP and DNS. Those things are not baked into that layer of the network. There are additional services that run above and beyond that so when we're talking about this different approaches is have an infrastructure that's really simple that delivers your virtual machines when you need them and put the intelligence into the application 
so it can request what it needs from the infrastructure and configure itself as it goes. And how do you do that? Well, there, there's a couple of things. I'll start with this concept of server templates. So years ago, I think it was five and a half years ago, now six years, when we started doing this, and back then it was public cloud only, we learned that it was really useful to be able to send up a VM and quickly, but it turns out you need to be slightly different each time, most of the time anyway, and you start getting into this VM sprawl situation. So we came up with this concept of server templates, and it's a nice analogy, because a VM is like a CD, make as many copies as you want, but they're gonna be identical, you can't change a single bit. A playlist, you can add and remove songs, you can change the order that they're in. So in a server template, there's two basic components, a VM, but in the virtual machine, we now put only the operating system. In fact, just enough OS to boot in, that's it. And we abstract out all the applications and configuration things you were going to bake into the image. Instead, those will now be installed at boot time. We happen to be using Chef, by the way, so we're leveraging an open source technology there. The idea is you have an abstraction layer now between the VM, the virtual machine, which is how that server communicates to the cloud it's running on, the resource pool, and the business logic, the scripts that were run at boot time, that configure that machine to be what it needs to be. It's like DNA that builds a server as you need it. So if you were booting up a server for MySQL, we call it a write image, but it, it really just means a, a virtual machine. You send an API call to Rackspace Open Cloud. You say, give me this Ubuntu image that only has the operating system. It does nothing. And once it's running, you're quite literally installing and configuring MySQL in this case. And because you do that, it gives you a tremendous amount of flexibility and configurability. And I'll show some of the things during the demo. Now, when it comes to the image itself, we have this concept of a multi-cloud image. Having images for all the different clouds that a particular server might wanna talk to and grouping them together into a multi-cloud image so that you can build a server template again for MySQL on top of this multi-cloud image that can quite literally instantiate in your own private open stack cloud, in Rackspace Dallas, and in Rackspace London, and in other public clouds as you may, without changing the business logic of what that server itself does by virtue of being able to configure itself at boot time. Now that's one. The other thing, leveraging this idea of having OpenStack as a very efficient way to provision the virtual machines the service that you need, we add a layer on top of it, as you can see in this diagram, an orchestration system, a management control for the cloud resources so we can automate what gets deployed there from a user perspective, who's got access to what, from a monitoring perspective, what's happening to the servers, from an alerting perspective, why do I do when certain conditions are met and react accordingly. That's what makes it possible for their architecture to be application driven instead of the infrastructure finding ways to self-heal itself, the application noticing, hey, a server failed, I need to launch something to replace it. Or I need to move something because I'm running out of capacity on this machine, I need to add more, per perhaps on an application load balance pool. So let me switch to the demo here, and everybody please cross your fingers because we've been having some fun with the internet access part. So let's see how we're doing. I opened up a whole bunch of tabs, oops. Uh, ooh, this is, let, me, let me switch to mirroring then to do this part of it. I opened up a bunch of tabs in advance, hoping that if something doesn't go well, we'll be able to leverage it for that. And can everybody see the fonts okay in that, in that size? So what, what we're looking at is the, the management system, the control system, and what you can see there on the left is we have the credentials so we can authenticate into different Rackspace clouds in my own private clouds and make API calls and stand up machines and take actions from those clouds. From one system, a single pane of glass to control many different resources. On the right side, we have this concept of deployments. It's not super useful to just have a long alphabetical list of servers, so grouping them into a container that we call deployments so you can manage systems, not individual machines. And it's really nice with red and green dots to be able to see what's running and what isn't. Uh, so for example, I have here my production environment, my hypothetical production environment that I'm running here. I already, I already opened the tab with it so that I can show you what's going on here. So it's a simple, so you can see the name of the deployment up here. It's a simple three-tier architecture, although here it's not in order. I have the database here, a couple of load balancers for redundancy, and what we call an array 
for the application servers. Here's a logical diagram of what that looks like. Your classic 3 tier architecture. We have this, th this term here for an array so that you have a way to auto provision or deprovision servers based on certain conditions. Notice here I have a master slave database, which is not what I have going on in this particular environment. And it's running in my own private cloud. Uh, so I have a nice simple environment that can serve as a good example of the kind of things you might want to do. Well, let's say that I want to have a DR environment running in a public cloud. It's a nice advantage to be able to have it there and not pay for the machines unless I'm actually using them. So how does this idea of server templates and cloud management come into play to bring me some benefits to make it a little bit easier for me? Well, if I go back to my main dashboard, uh, you'll notice I have another environment here that I call disaster recovery. And let me just switch to the tab where I have that. Oops, it's this one. So this, as you can see here, happens to be running in the Dallas Data Center for Rackspace. But notice that only the database is running, not the load balancers, they're inactive. So this is, uh, it's a slave to my production databases. It's synchronized with it. I'm pre-positioning my data in case I need to launch it. So if I was having a major failure in my internal data center and I needed to roll over somewhere else, a failure significant enough where I cannot recover even with a bunch of automation that quite haven't shown you yet, but I needed to roll over to a separate location, I can select uh, the load balancers I have here. I can do several things to them, but I'm gonna launch them, apply to selected. It. It's gonna take a couple of minutes and those machines will launch, although that's not really what's germane here. What's really interesting is that the database server configuration is the same for both machines. The one in my own data center and the one that, that happens to be OpenStack and the one running in Rackspace because I'm using server templates that have those multi-class underneath them. So the underlying infrastructure could be dramatically different. Different hardware, different networking configuration. It could be nothing similarly. Even the APIs from the two different clouds could be different themselves. We're normalizing that communication across them in this case, it's not as difficult an example because they're both OpenStack. They don't need to be both OpenStack for this kind of technology to be able to work. Let me show you how some of this stuff looks in action. So I'm going to click over here to add another column to my view. Oops, so you can see the server templates that I keep mentioning here. You notice that the load balancer is based on a load balancer server template and the database on a different one. So let me, I actually already have the tab open for the database server template to, and I meant to go here. So what you see here is, so you can see up here that is the database manager server template. What you see here is the multi-cloud image for this particular machine. This is really, as I explained, the magic that makes it possible to communicate, sometimes I call it resource pools, to not say clouds over and over and over. We make that possible by starting with a bunch of baseline images. That's the list that you see there, and essentially, we have here CentOS 6.3, Rails 6.3, and Ubuntu 12.4. And notice that for each of those, you can see which clouds they map into, because obviously those binaries are not identical. Uh, but what we've done there is to, to make sure that the content of all the images is the same. The version of the OS, the patch, the patches that they might have, we put an agent that they call right link, the version of right link that they have, they all have to be the same so that when the machine itself instantiates, we're starting from the same baseline no matter which of those clouds we're launching from. So that if I make an API call to Rackspace Dallas, to Rackspace London, and remember, as I said a moment ago, we put only enough operating system to boot, just enough OS to boot, but I know that I'm gonna get the exact same version of the OS with the same patches, with the same agent that I can talk to. We normalize that communication across all of them. Now we do a ton of heavy lifting creating all those images for all the different clouds that we work on. That's the, that's the foundational part of that. And then if I go over to this tab here, these are the scripts that actually build the machine to be what it needs to be. These happen to be chef recipes. So some of the stuff is pretty mundane, maybe perhaps even boring kind of stuff. Uh, as you can see the, the stuff over here, but it gets interesting when you look at uh, installing my SQL, configuring my SQL, there's a parameter in there, for example, where you can tell that node, are you the slave or the master, and what's the host name or the DNS name of the other machine, and the username and password, so you can start synchronization without having to go in and SSH into the machine. 
and do that all manually. If I was launching this machine, I would see fields where I could put in some of that information to do that. And again, remember, none of that is dependent on exactly where you're launching it, because you're abstracting that logic above how it communicates with that particular cloud. And I keep talking about at boot time, there's also lots of useful things you might want to do uh, operationally, snapshotting the database or uh, backing up certain things that many regular users that are not DBAs might not want to know that you want to encode into operational scripts to make it easier to do that without worrying so much about making mistakes or fat fingering a, a command and messing something up. And by the way, there's also this idea of decommissioning scripts. Little less useful in a database, but imagine a application server where when you're shutting it down, you want to let the load balancer know that it's leaving the load balance pool or disconnect from the database and such things. So that's how the machines themselves get configured. Now, let me go back and look at my, let me see, what was I gonna go here? Looking at my running environment. Give me one second, I forgot where I said I wanted to go with the, with the presentation, so, oh yeah. Sorry, I've been, I've been going in different directions with what to cover here. So let's look now at, in my production environment, I don't think I have it in this one. Let's look now at the load balancer. So I just opened the tab for the load balancer and I'm gonna look at the monitoring. In terms of the applications, looking at what's going on and being able to address the infra infrastructure and make decisions based on that. So, we happen to be running an agent right link into the machine so we can monitor what's happening and collect information about what's going on. We also install CollectD, an, an open source project. It's got a plug-in architecture, so if it's not a hardware metric or process things that we're picking up, you can write your own collectors to grab that information. Uh, what's interesting about that, and I think I need to, am I looking at the wrong server now? Oh yeah, this is the right one. So I'm collecting information about what's going on on the machine itself. Now, I can create alerts that can take action depending on what's going on in the machine. So for example, is uh, Apache running properly? How many processes are happening with Apache? And what do I need to do if that's not going well? Or is the machine CPU being overloaded? What should happen if a machine is being overloaded? Uh, so here's a really simple example. Uh, is Apache running whatsoever, and what should I do in that case? So let me actually run this one. Uh, to, 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 oops. Come on. Excuse me, I'm having some trouble here with my machine, so. Oh, this is what I wanted to do, I'm sorry. So, I can create some simple rules. So if I define that Apache is not running at that moment, what should I do? I can have it trigger a particular script that perhaps restarts Apache and sends me a warning via an email about what's going on. Or I can make it even more intricate. I can say, well, let's, and notice that this will repeat five times, I can say, well, Let's, uh, after 10 minutes, I want to uh, add another escalation that happens in another 10 minutes that sends me an email. And I can, uh, and I can create exactly the kind of message that I want to send there. So that I can have it perform a particular kind of script if it doesn't work. I didn't add that, but I could have it after doing that five tries, I can restart the virtual machine if that's not working. And if that itself is not working also, then I can send me a warning email to let me know what is happening with the environment. So that's how you see the particular environments noticing what's happening within them and requesting things of the infrastructure. Restart this machine, launch a different machine. Let me show you a different example with the alerts. What if a particular machine that I have here, so notice here I have two operational servers. So that's what you see here in this array, two machines running. So if the hardware fails on one of them and they're no longer running, most of the requests, all of the requests, are gonna be transferred to only the other server and it's gonna cause the CPU load to spike. 
So that's where I'm tracking what's happening on the CPU load for the particular application servers. The application itself notices what's going on. And then I can say, you know what? Auto provision more application servers into that load balance tier because I'm noticing that they're running too high. They're running too heavy. And because they're based on the server template architecture that I was mentioning a moment ago, you can have it be auto configured and auto provision, right? If those machines come up, they will join the load balance pool by telling the load balancer that they're there and then they will also connect to the database and be able to start transacting. That's the difference between doing some of that stuff manually and being able to do it completely automatically. And let me see. Oh, so this is the other part that I wanted to show you that gets really interesting. So I'm back into the environment that I'm denoting here as my production environment. Let's say that we've been working on a on, on a new version that we want to test. I keep talking about the server templates and how they can self-contextualize at boot time, how they configure themselves. You can pass values into the scripts before you launch a particular machine so you can make decisions about certain conditions are going to be set up. We call those inputs, and we group these inputs into the categories that you see here so that when I'm going to set up a particular environment, I can give it those parameters before it goes. In essence, it's a configuration database of all the scripts that are running in all the servers that are part of a particular environment. That's what I meant earlier when I was talking about managing at the system level, not managing individual machines. You can make a configuration change about what database you want your application servers to connect to, and it'll apply to all the machines in there without having to go into them one by one, and also without having to make a change into a VM anywhere. So that means that you can do things like this. If you're running this particular environment and you want to clone it to make a staging for a smoke test or some sort of kind of QA, you can quite literally clone the complete environment with just a click of a button that I have over here. And it's going to ask me if I really want to do that. And I'm going to say yes. And in about as long as it takes me to say it, it'll clone the complete environment uh, and because I've been making backups of my databases, if I were to stand up this environment, it will actually mount the storage from the latest, freshest backup that I've done for my database. So I can actually clone a running environment without stopping it, without having to do it at 2 in the morning very quickly. Now, this is identical in every way to the one that I had in production. So before launching anything here, I will go to Inputs. I will click on Edit and I would make some changes so that I don't have the new application servers that I'm running in the staging environment trying to connect to production. I would go down to my database category and over here, did I not click edit? Oh yeah. And over here, I would, uh, oh, this is why. I would have it connect to uh, qa.companydb.company.com. Uh, you know, the name that it refers. And such as that, I would make a few configuration changes that are dynamic. Once I have that, I click Save, although I'm going to cancel out of here. I select my servers. I launch them, and I have a staging environment that I did in moments identical to my production one. So that's on the management side. I kept talking about having a self-service architecture. So this is something that uh, one of our guys that happens to be sitting in the room built. Uh, to give an example of what an IT vending machine might be that an IT department puts together for the people that need services from there. Each, and, and I only have two examples, but imagine this is a grid with all the different application setups that the people that interface with your IT group needs. When you click on one of these, it quite literally launches the complete environment. The, the architecture that I've been showing you, we have encoded the configuration, not just of an individual machine, but of the complete environment itself so that a programmer says, you know what, I need this environment because I'm testing an, uh, the latest version of Tomcat or a particular patch. Instead of filling a ticket, going to IT, doing all those things, you can quite literally launch it quickly. Now, for financial control reasons, you might want to route that to somebody that's managing the project and looking at budgets and how all those things are implying. That's what I was talking about when I was referring to the cost factor earlier. You put all this power in the hands of so many people, it's incredibly useful, but they need to remember to shut machines down when you're not using them. We happen to run scripts overnight to look at who's running what and shut things 
that with some rules that are idle. And we also make it possible to keep track of the cost. Let me see if this goes well for me here. We realized that being able to keep track of the cost was supremely important. So in the environments themselves, I'm clicking through here to I think uh, we have called the report manager. So on the environments themselves, whenever you create a server, an account, a deployment, you can assign it machine tags. So I could have all the deployments that are related to a particular division or the company or to a particular project or to a particular category of some kind, I can assign them all the same category on those deployments. So then I can do in an automated way once a week, once a month, once a quarter, I can say give me a report where all, for all the deployments that have this particular tag. So report uh, equals uh, uh, department, uh, I'm sorry, it's uh, report colon, equals project X. And you can actually have this become a CSV file that gets put into storage or emailed to somebody at request. So now you have the ability for people to launch things as they need to, and then to be able to come back and keep track of who's running what and how much that is costing. Any questions on this stuff, by the way, since I'm gonna wrap up the, the demo part and go back into other ones? No? So. Oh, sure, Pl please walk up to the microphone so we can uh, record it. Hello. Yeah, so can you talk a little bit about how do you manage licensing for applications where, the, you know, there's, there's an uh, application that's part of the image and specifically if there's no key server technology in involved to get the licensing on. So I've been working on that myself from, from a few years back. That's tricky in that it's not a technological question but a business and legal question. You're really looking at the way that software is being sold evolving together with private cloud technologies and public clouds, because it changes the model. Not a lot of people want to buy enough licenses to be able to hit their peak load when they only hit that once a year, whatever that might be. So it really is a factor of how cloud friendly that particular company is willing to be. We've seen companies evolving so that they license their software also by the hour, so they can track it accordingly uh, by, by API calls into those particular cloud providers and do it that way. Otherwise, some vendors don't want you to do it for different reasons. That, that's a tricky one. It's a very much a case-by-case -case basis. Any other questions? So, I in essence, I'm talking about servers that are like stem cells. I came up this term when I was reading some stuff in neurology, pluripotent. I'll give you an extreme example here. I was talking to one of our guys in product management. We have a, a company out there that's running 12,000 servers only one VM, one VM. Many different server templates that do many different things, but only one VM to support with the tax level they need and their security policies and so forth. So that's a big component of the tremendous flexibility that you get, this idea that the machines self-contextualize. The other thing to consider is, so, so how do you get there? By the way, th this is an interesting cartoon that's meant to be a political cartoon, but I thought it was semi-appropriate here. And, and the crowd, the demonstrators are saying, what do we want? Gradual change. When do we want it? In due course. So what I'm saying is as you're developing new apps, and this ties into the subtitle of the presentation, when you're developing new apps for your private cloud or your service providers that are building public cloud space on OpenStack, don't do the exact same old thing in the new technology. This is what happens to all of us. We get used to exactly how we're working, a new technology comes along and we just deploy the same way. Look at newspapers, when websites came along, they still only published once per night and they were concerned about the space of the article because in the print world, column inches and delivery trucks matter, not on the web. Think of your environments in a new way when you quite literally have access to this infrastructure that you can configure and deploy easily and quickly and empower the people. That's when I was referring to about the dramatic change. The subtitle of the presentation, I said, why you shouldn't just put on the same socks that you were wearing before after you take a shower. Why develop the same kind of applications when you now have all this newfound flexibility? As the people that are here that are looking at deploying OpenStack-based private clouds and what those should be, you really should think about the way you want your applications 
to be able to run in the kind of things that you want your teams to be able to deploy. That's why I pulled a couple of quotes uh, from Garner. And that's why I showed the example of a hybrid cloud as the main example that I showed here is what can I do now that wasn't practical or feasible or, or economic in the past? Have environments that run really well in my internal infrastructure, but maintain the flexibility to move them over to Rackspace in case of an emergency or for cloud bursting or whatever that scenario would be. And sort of going past the ideas of just pure virtualization in hypervisors. So I see I'm coming close to the end and I was leaving time for questions, although it doesn't seem like there's a ton of them in the room. Any, any other questions? So I'll, I'll mention a couple more things. Uh, we make it really easy to test some of the software, as you can see from the link there. We happen to just coincidentally, for those of you that might live in Northern California, have a company conference next week in San Francisco. And it's about $1,000 to attend, but we're giving out free passes in our booth that's over there. But also, one of our senior product managers is giving a presentation later today. Those of you that might have attended the Samsung presentation, this is the technology and the tools that they use to deploy their own hybrid architecture, where they have things running in a cloud stack private infrastructure, and they have the flexibility to deploy things in a public cloud. Uh, Ud Paul is giving a presentation this afternoon where he's gonna talk about highly available architectures and how to engineer and deploy for those in this kind of environment for those of you that might be interested. So we have a few minutes left if there's any other questions. No? Well, thank you very much, everyone.